Our scripture reading uh, this evening is, we're going to start with the Old Testament reading, which is from Ezekiel chapter 47. We'll be looking at verses 1 through, no, yes, 1 through 12 of Ezekiel chapter 47. And what we are seeing here is a picture of the temple. Ezekiel 47, verse 1 and following. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the front of the temple faced east, and the water flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. He brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gateway that faces east, and there was water running out on the right side. And then the man went out to the east with a line in his hand. He measured 1,000 cubits, and he brought me through the waters. The waters came up to my ankles. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my knees. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the water, uh, brought me through, the water came up to my waist. And again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross. For the water was too deep, water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. When I returned there along the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and the other. Then he said to me, This water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the valley and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the rivers go, will live. There will be very great multitude of fish because these waters go there. For they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. It shall be that the fishermen will stand by it from En Gedi to, to En Angliaim. They, uh, they will be places for spreading their nets. Their fish will be of the same kinds as the fish of the great sea, exceedingly many. But its swamps and march, marshes will not be healed. They will be given over to salt. Along the bank of the river on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their waters flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be food and their leaves for medicine. And if you would turn in, uh, to the New Testament, John chapter 4. We'll be reading verses 1 through 26 of John chapter 4. Many of you know this, this is the... Uh, incident in which Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well and has a conversation with her. And uh, as I will make the case, it tells us about the temple itself. Verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples... He left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, 
But whoever drinks of the water I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will begin, uh, will become to him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come to her to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have said well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, where the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When He comes, He will tell us these things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. And finally, from our passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which the temple you are. Let us pray. Father, we have a lot of scripture before us. And for some of us, it might seem overwhelming. But I pray, Lord, that you would pour out the Spirit that we may have understanding. That we may see how you have worked in history to make us your temple. That we would be uh, rivers of living water. That the water would spring up in our hearts. And that we would uh, flow outward. And everything that would flow out of us would continue to take dominion over the world. As you've called us to do. So Father, give me the words. Fill me with the Spirit. Let us hear from Christ. It's in his precious holy name we pray. Amen. I know that we preached on these last couple of verses uh, that I read to you last week, but it's worth looking at again because of the truth that's still there to be found. To see how God uses us for his glory in the process of expanding the gospel over the entire world. Now, as we saw last week, God's presence is with his people, and that's what makes a place a temple. In our text, we saw that it is his presence with us that make us the temple. It says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Paul is showing us that since he, the Holy Spirit, dwells with us, then we are the temple. We are the place where God meets with his people. We are the place where we are united with Christ together. It is a place where we worship in spirit and truth. All of these things come together in the temple. Now, it must be pointed out that we are seeing one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. The Spirit has a lot of purposes uh, that he, he performs today. Some of it's restraining evil. Some of it's correcting us. Some of it's doing that. But here he's dwelling in us for the purpose of bringing us into the temple and making us the true temple. This is the work of the third person of uh, the Trinity. Okay, We do believe that he's fully God, Okay, just like uh, Christ is and the Father are, fully God in essence. But that's his, his role is working in us. Now, another thing that we want to see, not only do we see that the Holy Spirit works in us and that we are the temple because of the presence of the Spirit in us, but we will also want to see uh, the fact that, that, that there really is only one temple of the Lord. All right. When, when Paul writes, you are the temple of God, he doesn't use the definite article. Now, remember the definite article from your English classes back in high school. All right. It was the, the word the. OK, so when you use the definite article for something, you might say 
okay, uh, I know this is a bad example, but that is the Timothy who wor- who is the you know working as a pastor at the church. I'm the only one that, that works as a pastor of the church. I'm not the only. You could say I am a Timothy because I have my son here, and he is an a Timothy too. But you you would say the to distinguish that one is the one that's whatever in the role. I should have thought about that beforehand, but I didn't, so it's on the fly. The point is, is that when you look at this verse, you it says you are the temple of God. In the Greek, there is no the. There's no definite article. And that's important because whenever Paul uses the Greek word naos, which is the temple, anywhere in the New Testament, he leaves off the definite article. Now, why would he do that? Because the definite article is not necessary. When there's only one temple, there's no reason to use the definite article. There is only one temple. Right? We are not a temple of many. We are the temple, the only one, the one and only. Uh, um, even though, and this is kind of where we're going to go, and we're going to answer that big question. Even though the temple in Jerusalem was still standing, at this time, already, it had shifted, the presence of God had shifted from the temple in Jerusalem to the true temple of the people of God. And Paul is making the point that y'all are it. Y'all are the temple. Now, remember, I've also pointed out that this news to the Corinthians would have been hard for some of them to take. They were Jews in their midst. They weren't just Gentiles. They were Jews, and they were used to going to Jerusalem every year for the Passover to worship, and they were still involved in that. And here, Paul comes along and says, no, you are the temple. They would have, they would have thought, how, how is that possible? All right, how is that possible that we are the temple and we don't still go there? Okay, so the question would have come up in their minds, well, what about the temple in Jerusalem? What about that? Okay, so I'm going to ask the question and deal with this question. Actually, I'm going to deal with it twice. First, I want to deal with what Christ tells us about the purpose of the temple. In other words, taking dominion. The location of the temple, Mount Zion, okay? The timing of the temple, the, the now, the presence of it, and the duty of the temple, which is to worship. These are the things that I want us to look at today. And then next week, we're going to look more closely at verse 17, and I want to answer the question again with the emphasis on Christ's priestly ministry in fulfilling that uh, command there, Okay? So it's important for us to revisit this, uh, revisit this truth because over and over again, Jesus made it clear that the temple that was there in Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. And if the temple was destroyed, again, the Jew would say, where are we going to worship? Where are we going to do that? For that was everything, okay? They went to the temple. They had sacrifices there. Now, I'm sure that the Corinthians were beginning to see, okay, the sacrifice isn't necessary, but it was still hard for them to grasp. You're doing away with the temple. That's everything. So we come back to, turn in your Bibles, back to John chapter 4. And in this dialogue, the woman at the well, with the woman at the well, he's going to answer the question of where we worship. In fact, when we look at this action, I think, or this section, not action, this section of scripture, I think it's dealing more with the temple than it is with the woman. It's more about the temple of God than it is about the woman. Now, if you want to tell me I'm wrong later on uh, over a cup of tea, go ahead. That's fine. But I, I'm beginning to see the importance of the temple throughout the New Testament and the fact that we, a lot of times in evangelicalism, we just don't get it. We, we fail to see that. And, and it's, just, it's slowly as I begin to see how important it is, and especially in reading in 1 Corinthians that we are the temple, it's important that we understand what does the temple mean? You know, why is it there? Or why, was it, why did God do it? And all of these things. And why, is it, why did he get, away, get rid of that one? All right. So we start with this story or not this uh, event that took place. And Jesus is going through there. And, and uh, he's thirsty. He's leaning against the, the well. And the woman shows up. And he says, would you give me a drink, please? All right. He's not supposed to be talking to a Samaritan if he's going to be a good Jew. Okay. Um, by the way, this is a sign right there that shows you the fruit that the temple what was supposed to be is not there. 
because they still have this hatred for the Samaritans. Who were the Jews supposed to be? They were supposed to be the light on the hill, the city on the hill. They were supposed to be have the, li- the, the living waters that was spoken of in Ezekiel that we read about earlier, flowing out of the temple and going into all the nations. And what were they doing? Y'all, you Samaritans are dogs, okay? By the way, that's, I know we, in our culture, you know, especially rap culture and everything like that, people think, hey, dog, you know. In their culture, that was the worst thing you could call somebody was a dog. Because dogs were filthy. They were, they just roamed the streets. They were a pain. They didn't have them for pets, okay? They didn't have Fifi, the, the poodle. None of that was going on, okay? It was just, a, they, they, they were seen as the lowest creature, almost, almost as low as pigs, all right? Almost as low as pigs to the Jew. So they thought of them as, as, as dogs, and, so, and yet they were supposed to be pointing them to the true temple. So she says, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Clearly showing a failure of, to bear fruit and to be a place of living water for the temple and a light to all the nations. And notice that Jesus doesn't answer the question, okay? He, he, he does, he's really good at that, okay? They ask him a question, and he just keep, keeps right on going because he's got a place to go, all right? Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, what is living water? Living water is water that's running. It's water from a spring. It's water in a river. It's water that you can drink. It's water that's good. It's not stagnant water. See, they, they had two good illustrations right there in, in, uh, in Judea, in Jerusalem, or outside of Jerusalem, in Israel, of living water and unliving water. Living water was the Sea of Galilee, and flowing down like that. But by the time it got to the Dead Sea, guess what? It was no longer living water, okay? It was death. And we can think of, you know, the stagnant water. It's, it's, ba- it's bacteria. You'll drink it. You die. And in a, in a desert community, which Waco is quickly becoming, in a desert community, water is everything, all right? Water is everything. I, mean, I say that because we went out to swim in Waco, the, the lake... And they said we couldn't do it because it evaporated so much that there was no beach left. Anyway, but the point is, is that living water is that that's flowing. It's like a stream. It's like uh, uh, back in Tennessee, whenever Heidi and I go there, I'm just, I'm just, I marvel at the fact that you'll see somebody's house and right in front of their house is a stream and it flows year round. It's not like streams here in Texas where it only flows whenever it rains. It's, it's just, it's wonderful. It's just this awesomeness. So that's that picture of living water. And then I imagine you could drink from the rivers. I, I don't know. You, I guess you could, but they flow everywhere. And so this is this idea of living water, but that's not what he means. Okay. We're going to see, he doesn't mean that water's flowing in a stream. He's talking about something else. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. Where then Uh, Do you get the living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Okay, are you greater than that? Well, the obvious answer is yes, he is greater. Okay, she probably expected him to say no. Okay, we probably said no. Okay, but um. I think at this point, right by right by now, at this point now, he's are, he's still thinking about the temple, and so that's why he's bringing up this living water. When we looked at Ezekiel again, that was a picture of the temple, all of those rivers flowing out. All right. So he says, "Whoever drinks this water will thirst again." He's telling her he's he's making a difference, not the physical water. I'm not talking about Jacob's well or any streams. I'm talking about something richer than that. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. Now, given the picture that we have of Ezekiel and the fact that there's river, a river flowing out, 
And every 1,000 stadia or whatever it was that he goes out, it's deeper and deeper and deeper. Do you see where this imagery of living water comes from? That the gospel flows out of the temple and the farther and farther it goes, the more and more it touches. It's taking dominion of the world. It's the gospel expanding over the world. That's the picture of the true temple. So Jesus comes along and he comes and he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. They're still thinking, no, the temple in Jerusalem. And he's saying, no, there's another temple coming. There's another temple that's about to be here. And it will be a temple of true living water. That the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. Jesus wants to make the Samaritan woman a part of the temple. Now look at the richness of the grace and beauty there. This is not a woman with a good reputation at all. Okay? She's had five different husbands, and now she's living with a man who isn't her husband. They, I'm sure the Samaritans themselves were pushing her away. They wanted nothing to do with it. That's why she comes at noon of the sixth hour. Nobody comes to the well in the sixth hour. Uh, it's the hottest part of the day. So they stay away. And she comes by herself. All right? That's what Jesus is doing. And that's what he's doing with us. He's turning us into the temple so that we would have a fountain of water springing up in us of everlasting life. Okay. He says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living waters. Again, he says that same thing again in John chapter 7. He's trying to make the point that the true temple is a temple of life. That the true temple is a temple of life that gives life. So that's who we are. We're the temple and we have living water in us. Because, you know, we know we've believed and that's a part of who we are. And so this is what, this is where, uh, you know, God is doing in us to make us, you know, we're part of one of these little streams out in the middle of the world somewhere. And that that God is hoping, we're hoping that God will use us. Now, he's told us kind of what the purpose of the temple is. But even though he hasn't mentioned the temple, I still think, like I said, I think he is, he is, the temple is in his mind. Because of the centrality of it. Next, he's going to tell the woman that the location of worship is changing. All right. She says to him after perceiving that at least he's a prophet, he says, she says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Okay. You want to know about worship wars? They had true worship wars here between these two people. The Samaritans were saying, well, we can worship here on Mount Gerizim. And they're saying, no, you've got to come to mount uh, the temple mount and worship here where the temple is, okay? And the Jews were actually correct in that. That's where God had placed them. That's where he wanted them to be. Um, But the, the, the common thought of the day was that you had to go to the right temple in order to worship. But Jesus is about to change that. He says, woman, believe me that the hour is coming when you will neither, uh, well, you will neither on this mountain nor in the Jerusalem worship the Father. He's pointing to the destruction of the temple and the creation of the new temple. He's letting her know that the physical location is no longer important. It's the spiritual location of the temple that's most important. Well, where is the spiritual location? Mount Zion. Well, Timothy, isn't that in Jerusalem? Not that Mount Zion. That's not the one we're talking about. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. He's telling us that the temple and the city of God are spiritual in nature. And that that spiritual reality is much greater than the physical reality. So our location when we gather together is Mount Zion. But it's not some place that we can travel physically. We can only come by faith. We can only come as we gather to worship. We can only come by being indwelt with the power of the Holy Spirit. It's all God's grace and mercy that he gives to us. Okay? 
So he's changing the location. It's no longer in Jerusalem. He's doing away with that. Now he's about to say, it's also, uh, this change is coming about uh, at a specific time in history. He says, but the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Okay, now just I want to take a step back here, and we're going to focus on this verse, because it's so instrumental for us to understand what it means to worship. And that's the purpose, right? That's the perp- one of the purposes of the temple, is that God brings people out of the world so that we can worship Him. So how are we to worship? All right, we, we also, uh, we missed the phrase, and now is, but we'll come back to that in a minute. The problem is, is that we, we get focused on what does it mean to worship in spirit and truth? And it's almost as if we, we almost lose our minds when it comes to this, because it, it's, it, it's like we think that this is some sort of mental exercise where we come in and we personally reflect upon ourselves and upon what God is. And we sit and we become very pietistic, pietistic in our behavior. And although piety is good part of worship, but we fail to understand that that's not what worship is. It's not thinking good thoughts. Okay. I once had a guy tell me, he said he loved to go running on, on uh, Sunday, the Lord's Day, because it freed up his mind. It gave him a chance to think good thoughts. Okay. About God. And it, he was talking about that. But that's not worship. He was saying that spirit, I was worshiping in spirit and truth because I'm thinking good thoughts. All right. Well, you can't worship God if you're being disobedient to God. It just doesn't work. So what does it mean to worship? Well, what's the word worship mean? It means to prostrate oneself before the one being worshiped. You're laying yourself out. You're bowing down to Him. To worship in spirit and truth is to prostrate ourselves before the God, before God in spirit and truth. We're, re- we're recognizing that we're doing this. We're doing, it's a physical action. It's a physical reality. All right? That's what worship is. All right? Uh, um, you get an example of this with the blind man in chapter 9. Christ heals the blind man, and when he comes back around, Jesus asks, do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said to him, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. What did he do? He got down on his knees and bowed before Jesus and praised him. That's what worship means. It's the word, I'm going to mess it up, proskuneo. I think I got that right. Proskuneo. And in Christ's day, there was like three different meanings for it. It it meant to, in all three of them, you see this subservience level on it. To do it at all, to use it at all. In one one way was to kiss the hand to to one or towards one in a token reverence. All right? You would come down and you would kiss their hand, showing that you're revering them, you're exalting them. Among the Orientals, especially the Persians, it was to fall upon the knees and touch the ground with the forehead as an expression of profound reverence. So you're seeing the same theme over and over again. But third, in the New Testament, it meant kneeling or prostration to do homage to one or make, um, and I'm going to mess up this word, obeisance. Did I get it right? Yeah, that's the way we're going to say it. Obeisance, anywhere you're going to revere them uh, to, in order to express respect or to make supplication. So if we're to worship Christ, we're to bow down to Him. If we're to worship Christ, we're to lay before Him. That's what the man did when he was healed. So the blind, blind man, he discovers Jesus, he discovered His hymns, and he shows great respect and lays down and worships Him. They did the same thing when He was raised from the dead. They got down and they worshiped Him as He should be worshiped. It's very physical in nature. The point is, and this is showing us how it is that we worship. The point is, is that we don't get lost in the the spirit and truth and losing it and thinking that it's some sort of mental exercise. It's It's not void of mentally thinking about what's going on. It's not void of thinking that, but it's not exclusive too. Okay, so worship is actually laying ourselves out before the Lord. Now to that moment. When is the moment that it's coming? He says, but the hour is coming and now is 
when true worshipers will worship in fa- the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such worship, worship, such to worship Him. In becoming the temple of God, these things have become re- realities for us now. And it became reality when Jesus was still on the, temp- on, uh, still in, on the earth, work in His ministry. Okay? So what we're seeing is we're seeing that the Spirit indwells us, thereby making us able to be in God's presence, but also making us the temple. We are the temple because there's only one true temple. We are called to worship in spirit and truth. And the key idea is that worship, we're to prostrate ourselves before him and that we meet on Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So when we come back to our text in Corinthians and it says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? That that's the very essence of who we are. We are people who worship God. We are people that have living waters flow up through us and come out of us. Now, it's very interesting to note, and I love this, and I hope you see the richness of God's grace in the middle of this, that this woman that nobody wanted anything to do with in Samaria, and and the fact that she was Samaritan, became... um, became filled with, became a river of living waters. Look in John 4, verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, Not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him and we know that he is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. It was in that moment that they themselves became fountains of living water springing up into everlasting life. God used the Samaritan woman as a fountain. That fountain led to more fountains there in Samaria. Let us close in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have made us the temple and that you have given us living waters. We pray, Lord, that you would fill us with the truth and that those living waters would flow into our community and continue to flow throughout the world. And that the gospel, your son, your king, would take dominion of the earth. It's in your son's name we pray.